Brilliant. Um, so I'm following on from two fantastic talks, so I don't particularly need to uh, introduce Coco TV and what it is. Um, but I'm here to talk about Forestero, which is a uh, verification framework that we're overlaying over the top of uh, Coco TV, and I phrase it as Coco TV, Coco TV with batteries included. Um, so my name is Peter Birch. Um, I'm a VP of Engineering at Vipercore. Um, I live and work in Bristol in the United Kingdom. Um, there's some details for me if you want to find me. Um, but who are Vipercore? Um, uh, we are a company that's building uh, accelerated memory management technology in hardware. Um, we can offer up to five times fi faster Python with no code change. Um, and we're quite a small team at the moment. Uh, 14 engineers in Bristol and Cambridge. Um, and out of that is a six person hardware team. Um, our problem is we have a really big challenge. We're building everything from a CPU and a completely custom memory system all the way up to a CPython runtime. Um, we have a very big challenge then. Uh, we have a small team, we have a relatively small budget. Um, we're largely using free and open source tools, so Verilator, CocoTB, GTK Wave, um, and our design complexity is building really, really quickly. And we need, because we have that small team, we need design engineers to be building robust smoke tests, but we equally need our verification engineers to be pushing that much further into uh, constrained random test cases. And ideally, what we want them to do is use the same test framework, to use the same libraries. Um, and CocoTB gives us a great foundation for that, but we needed something more from it. So to give you some idea of where this sort of fits in, um, CocoTB is, we view, the perfect and super flexible framework, but it's very light to touch when it comes to a methodology. It gives you um, the, the basis to write a single test. Beyond that, it's up to you. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we have something like PyUVM. It brings the full UVM ver verification methodology. If you're happy with that, that's great, but there is an awful lot of sort of strictness to it. Um, and, and so we sit in the middle ground. Um, we kind of take bits from UVM in terms of the idea of uh, drivers and monitors, scoreboards, but we give them to you in a much lighter touch way. You can partially adopt them, you can fully adopt them, um, and, and you can use a mix in your test benches. So one of the things that we have kind of rely on in Forest Hero is that uh, test, generally your DUT will look very similar to you as a design team. You're probably going to have a clock and reset. You're probably going to have a bunch of interfaces. You will have your IO hookup style of choice. This is ours. That may not be your liking. Um, but you know, you'll be using things like APB, Axie Stream, Axie, uh, full fat Axie. You might be using other, other interface standards. But generally, your design, if you follow good design practices, is going to be fairly standardly formed. Um, so uh, I've hopped around here a bit, sorry. Um, so uh, what we want to do is generally have a test bench that is wrapping that and taking those principles of, well, my design looks fairly normal. Um, so this is, this is a Forestero test bench. I've jumped in rather deep here. But um, at the top of it, I'm pulling in Forestero. I'm pulling in then some standard components that we've written. Um, and we share these. So you're more than welcome to go and look at how they're written. Um, we then declare a, a, a Test, a, a class called test bench inherits from this uh, forest area primitive called base bench. Um, you identify your clock and your reset to the bench, your primary clock and reset. And we're going to use that in a lot of other places. If you have multiple clocks and resets, you can use those, but we, we just grab the default ones. Um, and then we start hooking up interfaces. So here we're wrapping that same DUT. And I'm saying rather than doing individual pin hookup, um, I have an APB interface. Um, it has got config. You'll see. Up there, I've got config as a common sort of part of the name, as a prefix. Um, so I'm, I'm, it's an APB interface. Here's my DUT. Here's the common prefix in there. Um, it's in a particular role. It's responding to an initiator, so it's a responder. Um, and then what I haven't put here is you can also specify an I.O. style. So you can say, this is how my signals are generally made up. The default I.O. style is our default preference. So it's the I underscore prefix name, signal name. Um, so that's what's going on behind the scenes. And then I'm gluing in. Um, a driver and a monitor for that signal, so um, something that's going to send and drive that interface with transactions, and then observe the responses coming back out as APB is responding to it. And I'm similarly wrapping an Axie stream interface. You can wrap full Axie interfaces, uh, and it just extends. The big bit then is when you get to your test, your your individual test cases. Uh, we slightly changed the CocoTB syntax, um, and uh, we have a custom at testbench.test case, or whatever your testbench class is, dot test case. Um, underneath, um, we're effectively stitching a layer around the CocoTB test bit. Um, we're adding some custom reset 
initialization routines and so on and so forth, um, and then it will just kick off your test. Um, what's missing here is all of the stuff that's setting up your clock, your reset, initiating IOs. Um, it's all automated by the test bench behind. There's a, there's a standard sequence. Uh, if you want to modify that sequence, you can turn off the reset. You can turn off the IO initialization. You can customize the timings around that. So um, I think by default, it's sort of, uh, we put your design into reset for 10 cycles, initialize some IOs, wait for 10 cycles, bring it out to reset. Uh, but if you want to play with that, you, you've, you've got the control to configure it. Um, and then once you've set up your design, you reset it, uh, which has all happened for you, you just start providing stimulus to the design. Um, so here we're going to the APP driver that we've got, and we're just enqueuing a access, um, and Forrester in the background will work out the first time it can service that, and run it into your design. Uh, you can wait for a response to come out, um, check it in however way you want, uh, and, and move on. Um, if you've queued up lots of stimulus, uh, Forrester will automatically sync that into your design. Your test case doesn't have to sit there and wait around for it. It can just chuck it um, at, at the monitors and drivers and, and wait for it to complete. Um, so sat behind this uh, is base IO. So base IO is how we're wrapping our, our buses, our signals. Um, they're, they're, again, they're just classes. They're relatively easy to declare. Um, you pass through uh, the DUT, the prefix name, the IO role, whether it's a responder or initiator, uh, and the IO style, and then you just give it a list of the um, sort of ex signal extensions you want. So here's, here's the ones for APB, um, and then it's, as we saw, it's fairly simple to, to stitch up. Um, we, <laughs> we're not always completely disciplined in how we interface uh, with things. So uh, Axie Stream, we may not implement every single signal every single time. Um, so we have a graceful fallback. So if you, for example, don't want to implement um, strobing against your interface and you're just always going to send uh, every channel being valid, you can leave that out. Uh, you'll get a little warning in your log saying, I couldn't find the strobe signal. Uh, and, and it will move on. You can, in the interface or in the instance of the interface, say, uh, if this signal isn't provided, this is a default I want you to use. So, you know, I want to, it always to sample as all bits set or all bits not set or, or, or anything in between. Um, we use data classes very heavily. Um, so we have a, a custom base class for data classes which attaches on uh, the site, si uh, the cycle of the simulation at which it was sampled. Um, but other than that, they're just data classes. Um, we then use these uniformly in drivers, monitors, and scoreboards. Uh, they're really powerful. You can do things with data classes like, say, uh, for example, if I wasn't interested in the mode field in comparisons, I can put an exclusion in the data class saying, never compare this field, and it will silently ignore it for you. That can obviously be very dangerous, but if you're using it to attach extra metadata simulator uh, information that your simulation needs to look at, but you don't care about your scoreboard, you, you can use it for that, which is quite powerful. Uh, drivers become really, really simple um, by default. Uh, so your driver already has all of the guts in it for queuing up your transactions, um, for scheduling when that those can go into the design, for notifying other parts of the system. So all you need to do is do the IO stimulus bit. Um, you can do self.io.set, um, the component you want to address to, the bit of information you need to put in, and so on and so forth, um, wait for clock edges, and so on and so forth, and, and down you go. Um, this equally has the graceful fallbacks. So, uh, for example, say penable wasn't implemented in my interface, um, it will just silently skip over it. It will have warned you at the front that it couldn't find it, uh, and then later on it will just uh, em emit the signal setting. Uh, monitors, I haven't shown in the presentation, but they look very similar. Um, they monitor for signal values and then they emit it um, back upstream. Um, so, stat, we've got monitors, we've got drivers, um, we've also got a built-in scoreboard. So if you register a monitor to the test bench, it will be automatically given a scoreboard channel unless you say otherwise. So any transactions that it captures are going to be queued up, and if they are not matched by the end of the simulation, your simulation will fail. Um, so uh, every monitor gets a de dedicated scoreboard channel. Um, as those signals are captured, they'll be pushed in. And then your golden reference model or your test case needs to provide reference transactions which get pushed into a separate queue. Um, the scoreboard then automatically decants, uh, compares those queues, and reports failures. It can run in either a fail fast mode where the very first comparison, it will abort the simulation, or it can run in a full reporting mode where it waits to the end of the simulation to tell you about everything that's gone wrong. Um, it is a 
uh, fairly permissive scoreboard in that you don't have to have golden reference transactions queued up before you start to push uh, captured transactions. You can do it either way around and it will just marry the front of those two queues together whenever it sees um, a matchup. Sequences. So we've taken a slightly different tack. Um, for anyone that, that's come from a UVM world and heard of sequences and sequences and virtual sequences and virtual sequences and the, the stack of stuff that builds up, um, we're taking a rather light touch approach to this. So obviously you will have different monitors and drivers in your test bench. You will have overlaps between those that want to, you want to commonly interface with different drivers. Um, so you need something that works between them. And for that, we use sequences. Um, Sequences uh, are written a bit like this. So they are a um, normal sort of async function. Um, at the very front of it, you give it a decorator saying this is a sequence, and then you list out uh, the things that you require that sequence to have. So I know this sequence is always going to need an APB initiator driver. It's going to need a monitor, and it's need a, 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 dri a, a full Axie driver. Um, now, this isn't saying I need to map precisely these names to my test bench, the sequences are reusable. So these are just local to the sequence. Um, and then you're passed in a special context object, which does a bunch of stuff for you in terms of allowing you to log stuff, uh, generate random values. Um, and then you're given the, the locks you requested, the config, the ARMON, and the drive. And then you can provide any custom parameters, like a starting address, the length of your transaction, so on and so forth. Um, and then when you want to actually queue some IO up, you create, you request a lock and the scheduler then waits to service you and say, uh, I have got, um, uh, I, I need these three locks, please only activate my sequence at the point that you can grant all three. Um, and then you can go on with uh, enqueuing your transactions, you can wait for responses, um, you can do f further stuff uh, and you know that you're not going to be clashing with anyone else during that interval. Um, at the moment, um, our sequence arbitration is, um, just done on a round robin sort of random, random arbitration. Um, we have plans in the very near future to introduce control over that arbitration. So you can say, you know, do you want to go high effort for give me the, the sequence with the most number of locks first or the least number of locks and, and, and have balance over time. Um, but they're very, very easy to write, very easy to stack up. And the demonstration design that we've got in the repo, I thought was bulletproof and this showed up in a bug in it in about three seconds. So. Um, um, Scheduling sequences are then uh, really, really simple. Uh, you create an instance of your sequence. You pass in the specific versions of drivers and monitors you want to use. You give it some parameters, and then you just ask the test bench to uh, schedule it, and it will do its best job to schedule that as soon as it can. Um, as with all the other stimulus, um, you can chuck as many sequences in, and the test bench will just continue to run until it's managed to sync all of that information to the design. Uh, you can also have sequences which are non-blocking. Um, so if you've got a sequence which is just pulsing valid, uh, a ready signal up and down, you don't want that to block the end of your simulation. You can say this is a non-blocking sequence, and it will just continue to run up until the point that your every other piece of stimulus is finished. Um, I should have, I didn't actually put a comment against it. You can parameterize our sequences as well, but um, I think I may need to extend that having seen the new features in CocoaTB. Um, uh, other things we've done, random seed stability. Um, if anyone's used random in Python, uh, if you use random in combination CocoaTB and you're not careful, uh, you'll find that your seed stability is not great between runs. Um, we explicitly have a random instance, and as we create um, drivers and monitors and sequences, they are given C, uh, new versions of that seeding. So if you're just tweaking with a sequence, that sequence will have its own random seeding and will not affect the stability of the seeding for the rest of the bench. Um, that allows you to tweak small things and investigate problems without causing global disruption. Um, and, and that's a great benefit to us. Okay, thank you. Um, Equally, we've got tiered logging. Um, so every single monitor, driver, scoreboard, test case all gets its own log. You can then tell uh, Forestero to specifically print out logs at different levels of that hierarchy, and it's all just there for you. So what we've got, we've got documentation you can go and look at. This digs down into components, how to build a test bench, um, API references, all sorts of stuff. Um, We've got an example project in the repo. Um, we plan to grow this more, but um, <laughs> just haven't had the time, to be honest. Um, but but uh, it does work. It runs. Um, we've got Forestero IO, which we've just published. So this is Viper Core's in-house versions of um, 
amber drivers. So we've got Axi, Axi Lite, uh, APB. We've also got some very primitive sort of streamer mapped interfaces, but it's a great place to start and get some components. And yeah, in summary, so it's a lightweight methodology atop CocoDB. Adopt as, adopt as little or as much as you like. Um, you can build robust uh, test benches really quickly. You can build reusable monitors, drives, and sequences. Uh, and it's fantastic for smoke benches, and it does scale well to constrained random test benches. Um, there's documentation, there's code and examples. Um, I have, as of yesterday, sat in the conference, been tinkering away to see how much disruption is caused by CocoTB uh, 2.0. Uh, it runs, it's fine, I've got some fixes, but largely it was a very small change, which is hopefully a good sign for the CocoTB guys. <laughs> Uh, as I said, we've got I.O. components, and I have stickers because this is the mark of any good open source project. Um, so if you'd like a sticker, please come and find me. But thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to open with the first question. Um, so there was already some sort of library of bus drivers. It was pretty minimal. This is Coco TV bus, was it? Yeah, yeah. It, it was originally in the repo, and then it got split out. Um, I understand that, is this the most advanced kind of bus driver set at the moment, or is this the mo most well-maintained set, or? So I, I, I used to love CocoTV bus, uh, and then I guess in the dark days of CocoTV, CocoTV sort of rejuvenated, but CocoTV bus didn't Got it. so well. Yeah. Um, so this was initially all based on CocoTV bus and sort of overlaid a bit more structure to it. Um, it is now completely independent. Um, yeah, cool. But yeah, yeah. So certainly inspired by. <laughs> is, is the intention that this becomes like the main set of bus drivers or like, you know, framework to do bus drivers long term? Are you, you, is, is there like a battle going on here or is it just kind of like, are you um, the default because you're the only guy doing it? Kind of thing? <laughs> um, I, I'd rather say just like, I think it's another way to go. It's a bit, you know, it's, a, it's, it's another option for people who don't want to adopt UVM. Yeah. I, I don't, I, I haven't talked to the CocoTV guys yet, but I, it's not like I'm gonna propose that this becomes part of the core library. I think the oh. CocoTV itself being so simple is just a fantastic place to start. Yeah. And if you want to overlay a methodology like this, that's great. I think what CocoTV could do is provide a sort of list somewhere of here are methodologies that are out there and you might want to adopt one of these. Yeah. Cool. But if it's the best implementation, I, you know, I don't see why it doesn't get, you know, adopted as the default, but yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> meritocracy, right? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry? I'm using another one. Olaf's using another one, so, all right. <laughs> it's the best, because using it. <laughs> it's not just proposing it a... some bus driver IP, it's a methodology. No, I know, I know, I know, but, but at some point, um, it is very valuable. Like, whoever has the most useful things wins, right? Probably, so. <laughs> Windows. We're happy if we're <laughs> <laughs> Cool. All right, and anyway, opening the floor to other folks. Yes. I mean, this is just a continuation on the team, but like, uh, Coco2B Bus has other things aside from AMBA. Like, how difficult, how much work would it just be to port to, to what you're doing? Uh, it shouldn't be very hard at all. Um, most of our monitors and drivers are very, very short. Mm -hmm. um, uh, even our full Axi drivers are 30 lines each. They're very small. So basically, we could do this on Sunday. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Cool. All right. So, <laughs> so Sunday activity is converting Coco TV bus to, to uh, <laughs> Forestero. Is that? <laughs> 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 All right. Sounds like a yes. Cool. Okay. Um, any other questions? Cool. Let's thank Peter. Cheers.